Do you ever feel that the problem you're working on can only be solved by changing the underlying infrastructure and system? But how do you actually get the opportunity to do that when everybody's focused on releasing the next app? That's what we're going to find out in this episode. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, this is Penny Hagen. Welcome to the Service Design Show. This is episode 106. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. Here on this show, we want to empower you with the most effective skills and strategies so you can build services that win the hearts of people and business. And somebody who knows how to do that is the guest in this episode. Penny Hagen is currently the director at the Co-Design Lab in Auckland, New Zealand. So Penny has been working on design projects that involve changing the underlying systems, infrastructure, and creating the conditions that provide long-term and sustainable change and improvement in, uh, in society. So in this episode, we'll be talking about things like how do you measure progress when you're just changing the system and you can't actually point to something that is tangible? How do you report to stakeholders who want to see shiny new objects and how do you balance between having a really open brief where everything is possible versus having two constraint um, uh, conditions in your brief where you can't actually move out how do you balance between the long-term vision and short-term results so after listening and watching to this episode you'll have a better understanding how you can actually deliver short-term results while at the same time working towards a more systemic and fundamental change of the underlying structure, which gives you better results in the future. If you like what we're doing here on the Service Design Show, consider clicking that subscribe button and that bell icon, because that way you'll get notified when we share new videos that help to level up your service design skills. So now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show, because here's the chat with Penny Hagen. Welcome to the show, Benny. Kia ora. Hi, Mark. We're on the opposite sides of the planet. I say that to the guests who are from Australia, but I think this is even for, farther away. Yes, yes. I'm in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in Tamaki Makoto, which is Auckland. Yep, it's nice, cold and dark here. <laughs> Benny, somehow your name has always sang around me. Uh, I've been in service design since about 2006, and I think even since then, your name has been dropped here and there. Like for the people who haven't Googled you yet, could you give like a 30 second history or introduction? How did you end up here? Okay, uh, sure thing. So I'm brought up in New Zealand, but I moved quite early on in my career to Australia. I spent 10 years in Sydney and I did my PhD in participatory design. Um, and at the same time, I was working in social design in Australia. So my PhD was practice-based, bringing in participatory methodologies to involve people in the design of services, strategy, and policy. Um, and a lot of that focused on youth mental health and um, working with young people to de design their own mental health interventions. So co-design or participatory design has been a big theme in the work that I've done, as well as well-being. Um, and then I've continued that work back in Aotearoa, New Zealand for the last nine years. Hmm. Benny, I, I, the fun thing about uh, being a, a service design show host is that I can ask you questions which you haven't prepared. And we're going to do that right now because we're going to do a 60 second rapid fire uh, okay. introduction. So I have uh, five questions for you and we have 50, uh, 60 seconds. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Penny, what's always in your fridge? Um, not, nearly always milk, <laughs> which I'm embarrassed about because that's very un environmental. We'll count that one. Which book are you reading or have you read recently? Oh, I've, oh I'm, I'm more of an articles person, so yeah. I'm making my way through the myriad of different RSA, Dan Hill, States of Change type articles that were produced in the last six weeks. Okay, we'll count that one as well. What kind of superpower would you like to have? Um, oh, maybe pausing time. 
I tried it. Uh, <laughs> what did you want to become when you were a kid? Um, I wanted to work for the UN, actually. Hmm. It's still possible. And final yep, question. <laughs> final question. When was the first time you got in touch with service design? Uh, I think in in the early 2000s, um, the participatory design space was intersecting with the emerging service design space, which at that stage was pretty academic. Um, there was, you know, service design logic kind of. Um, and Server Jeanette dominant, Blomberg. yeah. Yeah, yeah that sort of work, which then obviously became more of a popularized um, approach to service design in Australia. So we were a little bit behind um, some of the US developments in that case. But yeah, hmm. that was. Okay. Early 2000. Makes sense because, again, I, I've heard your name since the day I started uh, here in, in, in the service design field. Benny, um, I asked you to send me like an outline for what we're going to chat about here in the show. And you almost sent me an entire book, which was super interesting. Sorry about that. <laughs> I can't <laughs> wait to dive into the topics. Um, so let's, let's just do it. And my first question to you would be, um, you have a a goal or a destination or yeah, a destination where you're heading to. Could you share that destination with us? Sure. I guess like most people, there's lots of destinations. Um, the one that I'll focus on this morning is, um, I guess, the, the focus of the work where I am at the moment. So um, I've been working for the last sort of seven or eight years in a more of a systems and place-based um, social innovation space. So the destination is around shifting our gaze from services and programs as ways of fixing things to a more systemic, holistic view of what's going on um, and the complexity of the different challenges that we face environmentally and socially and um, supporting government um, to take a more complexity informed approach. So mm. we're looking at it um, as a whole and we're understanding the relationships between different things and the realities of what happens to people on the ground versus um, what we what we might intend through policy and building connections there. So it's a more holistic systems orientated view of how we might support change towards well-being. So so how does that 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 world looks? How 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 does the final destination look for you? How is the world different than it is today? Sure. Well, th th that's a um, different question. Yeah, how does the world look there when, when we have arrived at your destination? So I, I think one of the simple ways to articulate the difference is right now, um, despite some best efforts and intents, uh, we really often see a complex challenge um, like poverty and we think, of budgeting services, <laughs> or we see, um, you know, a complex well-being challenge, and we think we need more interventions and programs for people. And some of those things are really worthwhile, um, but we're not focusing on well, how is our environment, how is our border policy and urban planning contributing to people's well-being. So we tend to think about things, or we've designed ourselves. I, I don't actually think there's lots of more holistic views, but in terms of government responses. We, we divvy things up and try and fix people through specific services or interventions or in little boxes. So we kind of see the issues um, from a government perspective um, as siloed. And I mean, I'm not naming challenges that other people aren't very familiar with. Um, so getting more sophisticated about how we respond in ways that see issues as related. And in particular, um, if there's a complicated issue like um, youth mental health, then how do we see local government, central government, business, all of us as having a role to play in creating positive environments for young people as opposed to just channeling our investments into specific youth services, mm. for example, which mm. really only cover small parts of what the challenges are. So I think it's a more nuanced way of investing and enabling as a government to support communities to thrive in ways that work for them. It, sound, it sounds like a topic that's uh, quite dear to your heart. You've been involved with this for quite a long time. Can you take us back to the moment where you sort of realized that this was something that you deeply cared about? I don't know if it's a moment. I don't know if it's a moment. But, um, yeah, so I was always working in 
like I said, uh, spaces where well-being was the kind of focus. So working with different agencies, government departments and um, and organisations where we were trying to support well-being outcomes. Um, and I think one of the things that really showed up for me was that it didn't matter which door you came in, whether you come in through a mental health door or homelessness or family violence, the issues that it would come back to and the complexities are all very similar. Um, so it's like, well, how come we're not, you know, if you think about what the protective factors are, what the things are that we can invest in as a community that really help people have good mental health, um, they help people have good lives across the board. They're not, they're the same thing. So if we were investing really actively in protective factors and the things that help people to be well, so social connectedness, um, positive and relationships with environment, um, those are things that would benefit us across the board. So we don't need to be divvying up the, um, mm, the issues, mm. you know, safe, warm housing, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that's the root of lots of different issues. And so, but we kept dividing them up and coming at them from the problem space. So I think after a while I felt like we were, all the work I was doing was on really similar issues at the end of the day, even though they were being described as different things. So mm. starting to look at it as a more connected up um, system, but also in the last 10 years, there's been a shift towards more place-based work and innovation platform work where your the space is being given, thankfully, um, by government and philanthropics to take a, a more holistic approach. So the job of um, some of the place-based teams here and in Australia is much more about building strong communities, for example, um, or building capacity for different ways of working rather than saying you have to deliver X or Y server. So there has been a shift to allowing teams to try and explore that more systemic um, perspective. We haven't got it right yet. There's still lots of work to do. But there has been a shift in government's understanding to um, off and on, if you like, um, about different ways to invest in um, building capacity for, mm -hmm. for community wellbeing. Yeah, it's interesting that you say for the last 10 years, it's a whole decade, right? So the shift is, it's its a humongous shift uh, uh, that is happening. Also, you, how would you describe sort of the consequence if we either, it, the shift is already going on, so there is no uh, turning back, but if we don't, um, uh, yeah, how, if, if we don't, if we fail to actually implement this, what, what is the consequence? Well, I think quite often what happens is we think we're doing it and we name it a certain thing, but we don't shift any of the conditions within government or the power structures or the reporting mechanisms or the funding mechanisms. So we kind of expect people to work differently, but then ask them to account for themselves in the same way that... Um, that we have always done. So um, certain approaches within different governments, and I'm talking across Australasia, will want innovation and different ways of working, but they will still ask for predefined outcomes and outputs. They'll still report and monitor in an upwards way rather than an up and a down or a mm -hmm. down and an up kind of way. So I, I think our one of our challenges is that we're not quite brave enough. We're brave enough to, to carve a space, but then if that space gets a bit wobbly, quickly shut it down or or still say, oh, yeah, we said innovation, but we still really meant 600 outputs of these widgets here that make yeah, us feel yeah, confident that we've yeah. done something. Yeah. So we're still wavering in the broader conditions, I think, that really permit us to work differently. And and when you say uh, we're not brave enough, is, is that the biggest um, thing that is holding us back? Or because, yeah, being brave, it's hard to say to somebody, now you need to be brave and then the system changed. So what, what are those elements that, that are preventing us from moving into this desired situation quicker? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of things. One of them, um, one of them for sure is our commissioning and funding and reporting mechanisms. I'm a bit obsessed about the, f the reporting stuff because yeah. I think, you know, what we track is what we value. And so if we've got lots and lots of compliance systems running all across government and services where there's a real focus on people reporting, did you achieve X output? Did you achieve X referral? Then our gaze isn't on whether that made a difference or not. So so I've spent quite a long time just trying to support 
a different kind of conversation about change. But then I've shifted, I guess, to the more like what's really tangible. Where can we be tangible? Um, and measurement is a place, or monitoring is a place we can be tangible because. So one of the small things that we say to, like I do quite a lot of workshops across Australasia with government teams and that'll be a mixture of policy advisors, policy managers and service managers. And we'll talk to them about what questions do you ask your teams? So if you just say, where's the report? That's what they'll focus on getting. Do you say, what have you learnt? Um, were people involved in defining the success criteria? You know, like how do you create, even in your conversations, a suggestion that you, you're valuing a bigger picture. Um, and I think some of the things that have happened if we've become really habitual about things like reporting. So we'll follow the food chain of a reporting <laughs> line from a service. Um, and maybe it doesn't go anywhere, but people are very um, invested in making sure that the reporting happens. But is it actually feeding any learning? Is it actually doing anything? Possibly not. We've just got into this habit of kind of compliance there was really strong disruption of that through the lockdown period here where people just stopped doing that and said, we're not, don't re we don't require that reporting mechanism. We're just going to phone you every two days. And so some of that shone a spotlight on, mm, well, how, how helpful is this reporting and compliance work if actually you were better off just having some conversations with people about what they needed and how impactful they've been. So that is an area that I'm quite focused on because I think it's a really tangible place that we can look at is our reporting actually adding value because maybe we're not looking at the right things. Mm -hmm. So uh, with regards to uh, reporting, I think a lot of people uh, struggle with this, that we're um, sort of captured by the old ways of measuring uh, progress, measuring success, and that we all feel that we need different, different kinds of measures, but we're not really good at articulating what those new measurements or reporting tools are. I'm curious, do you have any examples from your own work how you actually managed to tr or try to change this or man manage to, to change this? Sure. Yeah, so I can talk about, um, I guess, the evolution of this process, if you like, So, because um, it's got some bits of some learning in it as opposed to getting it right in it. Um, sure. Yeah. One of the, uh, the things that fail the, that are most often the the interesting yeah. ones. <laughs> there was an initiative here that I was involved in a couple of years ago, and its legacy is still here, which is awesome. And it was a really brave piece of work that was funded by the um, New Zealand government around youth mental health life pack, and it had a very very open brief. Um, it was an innovation fund, um, and really the criteria was around technology and young people. And there was definitely an expectation at the beginning that apps would be produced. That was definitely what the government sort of had in mind. But really quickly, it, it was surfaced working with young people and with other people who influence well-being outcomes for young people, that it wasn't apps that was going to shift fundamentally young people's experiences. To, a lot, to, the, to the disappointment of a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, maybe that, you know, I'm sure there's good technology to be developed for sure, um, but as opposed to it being a silver bullet for um, addressing youth, um, youth wellbeing challenges. And instead, Lifehack worked on a range of different um, approaches, trying and testing lots of things, which is very, um, you know, they kind of followed a, an established labs approach, if you like. So lots of lots of testing and prototyping and saying, oh, that worked or that didn't work. And um, a real focus on capability building for, for those who have influence on young people. So not just who we might immediately think of, like educators and youth workers, but also police, policy makers, you know, local government, people that really can set up conditions strongly for young people. Um, so capability, working with them, different kinds of um, design processes in community, building community capacity, building collaborations and things. And lots of really positive outcomes and really strong, a uh, really strong network across the country of people who were tapped into and learning um, tr treaty-based practice. So Treaty of Waitangi here, which is our bicultural um, platform for how we work in Aotearoa and there's a lot of learning that we need to do about how that is done well. So that was embedded into the program along with design skills and different, a real cross-disciplinary kind of program. And we did start to see real benefits from that, but we hadn't figured out how to report that early enough. So mm. 
the government was still sort of expecting how many apps and how many young people will have gone through this program and how will their well-being have improved. And what we'd started working on was strengthening the well-being system of across the country and building up a new kind of workforce capacity. But we, we didn't quickly enough articulate or make visible how they should see the value in that. And we did eventually build quite a, um, well, I think it was useful. It was useful for us. <laughs> it's been useful for others. A layered um, evaluation um, kind of tool where, we, where you would um, look at an initiative and say, these are the benefits for young people that have been switched on. These are the changes we can see in the capacity and the environment. And these are how they're starting to affect a broader policy ecosystem. So we did get there, but we didn't get there until it was too late. Mm. And uh, could you zoom in a little bit and give us more just details about that last part? Because uh, making those things tangible and actually being able to say something about the impact on young people, on how did you do that? How does the layered model look? How does it work? Yeah, I should have brought a picture for you. There's a spiral, so I can share that later if people yeah, are sure. interested. Um, but it's really about naming the different layers of change. And so since then, we've kind of evolved that model of thinking into the programs that I work on now. So we'll we'll look at what are the changes immediately for people that we're working with right now. And for the most part, we're working with people through a design process. So people are building their own capability, agency, confidence through designing the things that they think are important for their community. So we're using design as a as its own capacity building for community mm -hmm. and it, the design process in and of itself will provide a space for organizations and families to work together differently so we'll track that too so people might say oh i'm more connected to organizations in my community than i was before that translates to a different sharing of resources so for example you might have one organization's got access to heaps of transport and the other organization needs to get stuff places so you count that as a as a meaningful outcome that actually resource that already existed in community is now connected up in a way that benefits that community better. So there's this sort of layering of understanding of what change looks like. And we're working all the time to develop our understanding of what the indicators of change are. So a, a specific example would be an organization might change the way it talks about people. So it might have talked about users or customers or clients and then they'll start talking about families or hear um, mm -hmm. the word until Māori is um, whānau. So that, that's, that's the sort of the base unit of Māori um, relationships is whānau. It, the best English translation, although it's not a great one, is, is family. But So the way that organisations talk about young people or families is a real indicator of where they're at in their kind of um, recognition of those groups as having agency. So those are the kinds of things that we've started to track. And uh, just a super practical question, because I can imagine people uh, listening to this would be interested. Do you actually go in and uh, listen to phone calls or how do you how do you how do you make it tangible that that the conversations or the topics of the conversations have shifted in the organization? Yeah, some of it's some of it's definitely observation. So we would do. Um, we have kind of formalized now different levels of learning, we'll let's call them learning loops, but um, so teams are doing their internal reflections on a really regular basis. So we've been working really hard across this last, I'd say five years to integrate developmental evaluation into the social innovation and design process. So my, my um, aspiration, I guess, <laughs> is that um, developmental evaluation becomes a skill set of social innovators or designers. So we, we get external support, specialist evaluation support where we need it, but it's actually integrated into our practice that people are kind of making those, collecting the evidence, being rigorous in that way. Um, and so we would do weekly internal reflections, which is just capturing the data. What are you doing? One of the, one of the downsides about design is that we often don't document very well and we get to the end and we're like, oh, that's pretty good. Let's keep going on to the next thing. But that doesn't help us make a contribution to the kind of greater dialogue. Um, so much more regular documentation of what we're seeing and observing. And then we have more external loops where mm -hmm. we go out and we're either, you might be observing. Mm -hmm. So if it's an observational opportunity, like watching people in a library, maybe we've done something in a space where with, we would have always done this with families, but let's say we're trying to make our space more friendly for children. 
So you can go in and observe there's more kids there and they're using the space in the way that you'd hoped, right? Um, but we would also go and interview people and they would tell us how they felt about the space or staff might say, might tell a story and you may or may not call out the fact that you've heard them shift their language. That may be something that you um, name with them or it may not, it might just be an observation that when I heard you guys talking and, and a month ago, you t this was the language and now I'm starting to hear these things. So it's slightly dependent on the context, but it's intentional to go back and gather that those signals and mm -hmm. yeah, signals have changed. And while you were explaining this, I was thinking there's a, a sort of uh, uh, the other side of the coin. So collecting um, collecting the data and uh, making those observations, that's one. But how do you communicate this to people who are used to getting uh, uh, evaluations and reporting in a completely, di literally in a different language? How do you make them... Still, you you can say okay, the language has shifted from uh, people to families or whatever. That still doesn't mean they see the value of that. Do you, is is that a challenge? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm right. Yep, it's a challenge we're right in the middle of. <laughs> it depends on who we're working with. So, um, we would have some funders who are kind of on that journey with us, and we've said at the beginning the things that we're going to count. Um, so this is my like simple simple like heuristic of it is we're going to demonstrate to you what um, shifts have happened for families and that that will be through their own language and reflection and observations and, and they will have set the value of good themselves. We'll, we'll track for you what we see um, the systems changes are and they will be local systems changes as well as macro change. So if, if you can see that in our um, local place-based system, money is moving differently, resources are being allocated differently, relationships are different, we'll totally describe and name those. And um, then adding a value to that is a, is a, different, is a different conversation. What's the value of that shift? Um, and we'll also name any macro shifts. So in some cases you might get um, a, a bunch of activity that's local, but it'll influence a national policy, for example. So we'll name all those things. And then the other things that we say we we are um, delivering, if you like, as value is the strategic learning outcomes that come from that activity. So we'll say, so you'll learn about what the changes are for families, what the changes are in the system, and what the strategic learning is about why or why not um, systems change has or hasn't occurred. So there might be a bunch of things that you think are going to happen and they don't. Why is that? Is that because actually the organization didn't end up having the readiness or the capacity that it needed? Or was it super, super keen and heaps of capacity, but really constrained by old school funding mechanisms? And mm. we want to feed that learning back into the system too, so that then our government and systems partners can potentially come in and make a shift then around funding or something. So yeah, yeah. for some people, they're well on board with that's what they're going to hear and learn. Sometimes you have to remind people, <laughs> remember that this is, you know, we're in this innovation space. We're not giving you widget output. So we just, that's sort of an, in a way, it's an educational bring people along. And in other cases, we have to show that and something that looks a bit more traditional and we're kind of working on both fronts at once so we're like yes it's this and remember this is the bit that we think we should really be caring about in this setting yeah what what, what i'm hearing in your story and uh, this is nothing new but i think it's good that we repeat it often is we need to have a conversation with the people who are funding us about what success looks like and we need to have that upfront, and we need to have have that uh, all, all the time, right? What does success look like? Is, is that is is it the launch of a new app? Then it's probably not a project that we should embark up uh, on. I see you nodding, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we talk about silver bullets all the time because that's what people ask for they're like can you fix this problem and it's like well no not really because that's a systemic historic problem that stems from structural racism and ongoing colonization so so we can totally be working sure. on addressing yeah. some of that systemic stuff but you're not suddenly going to be able to fix that with one app or one mm. one intervention so let's so it's a boring revolution you know there's the um indy johar talks about this stuff some of our changes that we're looking for are are quite boring, you know, <laughs> like capacity or 
yeah. infrastructure. Yeah. They're not like, yeah. oh my God, yeah. this Australian new amazing yeah. thing. Yeah. And then, uh, I, I think I haven't released the video yet, but um, uh, I, I just recorded a video where I talk service design isn't about winning awards. Like a lot of the things we do are, it's just the plumbing. It's, it's fixing the infrastructure, fixing the system. It's not visible. You know, it, the only thing you see is less frustration, but that's really hard to, to quantify and to get, uh, get credits for. But it's, it's the important stuff. Yeah, the grind. Yeah, I think the other side of that too is that often, and this is again a conversation I have a lot with our um, government colleagues, um, is, and then we talk about empathy for the system, right? Because most people are here trying to do their best. Um, they're not here trying to perpetuate a oppressive system, mm -hmm. um, but it turns out that actually often that is what we're doing. Um, and so we quite often look outwards to say, oh, there's a problem. How can we fix this problem in this population or something? Um, but if you go and do any genuine work about where that problem sits, it, we usually have to look back at ourselves. Like we're usually perpetuating something. We're usually creating a system which is making people more stressed and more sick and, you know, keep trapping people. So often we, our immediate thing is to look out and try and find something externally that we could fix. But most often the work has to happen internally inside our um, systems um, to to really, in a way, um, stop yeah. perpetuating yeah. Yeah. the challenges that we've yeah. created. Yeah, yeah. It's not as exciting sounding when you're pitching that. To people, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't. We we uh, we addressed the importance of um, reporting and measuring success in different uh, ways in in your journey towards. Uh, a, uh, creating systemic change and addressing and creating the right conditions for um, different kind of behavior. Is there a different example that comes to your mind where you think, oh, that that, that worked really well or that was a complete failure, something we can learn from? Oh, and another example, you're saying? Sure, yeah, if you have one. Um, I think... Images of success, I guess. So, um, so one might be. So, also some of these things come around and around. So, I, I quite often find that we'll work on a challenge, and then three years later it'll come back, and we'll be ready to action some of the things that came up. So, um, that's similar for some of this stuff. Is that you think, oh, that it really didn't, that it really didn't land, um, and maybe nothing really flies. But then five years later. There's a there's a appetite at a policy level to pick some stuff up. So that that's another thing is that it's a very long game sometimes. Um, one of one of the um, initiatives that I was involved in, which was a family violence um, initiative, and that's about um, supporting communities to lead their own responses um, and to build protective factors in their communities that reduce violence. Um, and protective factors are things like being connected to identity, um, gender equity, um, non-violent social norms. Um, they're things that are, are, are good for us all the time, you know, social connectedness, pro-social connectedness. Um, so, so if you promote those protective factors in communities, everybody benefits from that mm -hmm. in lots of different ways. Um, and so the initiative was to say, how could we get communities supporting those things and doing those things and so we went out and talked to people about their understanding well, what is it that you already do in your community to mobilize and support and contribute and lots of people do that really naturally they're running groups they're doing parenting classes they set stuff up they just you know they want to participate and um be community builders and so we then talked to them about how how what they were doing or already mapped and contributed to the reduction in family violence that was really motivating for people when they saw the protective factors and understood, oh, I'm already doing that. And now that I know it matters, I can also do these other things. I hadn't really ever thought about the fact that having boys toys and girls toys actually might set us up for some issues. I'll stop doing that. Um, so people could see how they could incorporate that into their daily life. And it was um, exciting for people that they could do small things to contribute to a really complex issue that mostly people don't want to talk about because it is complicated, it's traumatic, we, mm, people mm -hmm. have different 
personal relationships with it and it's really like how can i uh, it's too complex how can i possibly help um and this demonstrated that there was really little things that people were already doing that they could be even more intentional about the challenge was that community was kind of ready but actually we didn't have um the government infrastructure to support people to do that meaningfully so we could just say oh you go and do it but we didn't if, if the government also wanted to then monitor that or let's say um, reflect those same qualities in our public spaces and our public services, then we hadn't thought about how we would do that. So we were somehow just handing the challenge to community and going, can you guys do all the um, good work here? Oh, but what about what we're perpetuating in our own public spaces um, about about social connection and how we're excluding people through the choices we make in our public settings and stuff? So it meant, again, it was this thing of going out Actually, community was fully up for it, but government hadn't sorted out how it would coordinate itself yet or resource it itself to reflect that back to community and be a reinforcing um, capacity for that work. So we're still working on that stuff. I think it's a maturity thing, but it was another example of where we thought we'd go out and kind of try and fix the problem um, without aligning ourselves in a way. Yeah, and and then, then the question becomes, what kind of example are you setting? So if if you're trying trying to uh, uh, stimulate some uh, a certain type of values uh, in a community, then uh, really quickly they will put up a mirror and probably ask you if you adhere to those same values, right? Yeah. And I mean, one of the motivating questions for me when I was like, oh yeah, a little light bulb moment, is we can talk about organization, like co-design, you know, this. <laughs> Pained slightly about that word because it's been so deeply co-opted and now it doesn't really mean anything. Um, but, you know, ideas of co-designing with young people and doing doing all this great stuff. But if you just said, okay, well, look outside. If I was a young person and I went walking around my local neighborhood, would I feel valued? Do I see myself reflected in the institutions? How would people treat me and look at me? Well, they'd probably often look at you suspiciously. You probably wouldn't be welcome. You might even be moved on from public spaces. You know, like actually institutionally, we don't do great by our young people. And so those kind of questions, I think, really help us just think about, well, we want this thing, but over here we're behaving in this other way. So we're setting ourselves up to fail. So a lot of the work is trying to focus that back on environmentally, structurally, socially. We're not giving, we're not setting up the conditions for people to to thrive and to um, for well-being. So I think to me, that's a really easy way just to analyze, like to think about how well have we done to build the environment in a way that makes people feel like they belong there and they can spend time in those places and stuff. It's a good kind of yardstick. If you if you could go back and start a project over again or a new project with a similar challenge uh, comes by, what would you do differently? Um, like in the life hack example that I gave before, this was a really good lesson. <laughs> And it's not lost, like that. The, the, like I say, I just really want to acknowledge that the people that worked in that and as part of that still continue a really strong network and awesome work. So um, it's important to, for me to say that. But it really taught us stuff about um, the balance of tight and loose. So I would really, uh, um, now when we're talking about innovation and place-based work and systems change, I would argue that we, that you, I mean, you need to have a kind of, a direction that's good you can't define how you're going to get there yet because mm -hmm. you're working in a particular place with particular people and you need to understand the dynamic and the readiness and um but you do need to get quite and this is why we've been so focused on integrating the developmental evaluation into the practice you do need to be really good at picking up the signals that you're seeing and feeding them back in and then eventually refining down and saying okay we tried 20 things these four have really got um, strength here let's keep working on those because our our natural tendency is to keep getting bigger mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and do different things and it's actually really hard for us to stop stuff and we might go but I love that thing and you're like yeah but and it's fun but it's actually not really making a difference but we're really attached to it because it's got lots of kind of cool people stuff about it or feel good stuff about it and we're really bad at shutting stuff down um, so I think that's a thing that we've we've really tried to cultivate is how do you get precision but through doing stuff learning with communities about what matters but then use that to really focus where you're going 
work with people about how you're going to reduce down because that's hard. It's hard to let go of stuff. Um, but what, what we might accidentally have done is fallen back into our kind of programmatic um, mentality where we're like, but this is the best program ever and it's going to change the world. And you're like, it is an awesome program, but it's not going to change the world. So we have to now shift our efforts to the systems view again. So to me, it's the balance between tie and loose direction and specification, but don't keep it open the whole time or all you'll do is end up kind of just having a whole lot of cool stuff that doesn't yeah. necessarily go anywhere. Yeah, and that's what you mean with uh, the tight and loose. If it's too loose, if it's too open, then uh, you're probably not accountable. And um, th that you, yeah, yeah, you almost lose your, yeah. you get disorientated. Yeah, you need to tune quite specifically to a direction. Like we use, um, we use theory of change, which lots of people do, um, which means you've got to explicitly state how you think change is going to happen. But you interrogate that all the time and you're like, mm, is that still right? We did this thing, we learned something. And so it's a fluid tool, but it does give you a kind of, I guess, a north. Otherwise, yeah, you can get, because you're you're working on the ground and you're doing your daily actions with people, it's really intense. It's really easy to get into this mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of headspace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you have to be able to look up and like, so I, I do talk about how people get a really sore neck working in the space because you've got to see everything think long, but also deal with really intense stuff right now. And so that dynamic is quite exhausting. So you, you do need to have that precision, but you can't, you can't have that right at the beginning. So yeah, this balance between when to tighten and when to loosen, when to renegotiate, or maybe it turns out that direction wasn't the right direction, but you want to be informed in those decisions and intentional. Yeah, and I, I think um, this, uh, this doesn't happen naturally you actually have to this is work you have to have processes in place you have to have structures in place that help you to um, zoom in zoom out be tighter or looser um, because it's not something where you think oh well we'll do reflection we do a reflection because it's a natural thing no you really have to dedicate attention time resources to to do that at least that's my experience yeah yeah, I would say that our our team is really um, reflective because if you watch people, they'll never do the same thing every single week. They're always like, oh, it didn't work so well last week, I'll shift it. So that reflective practice is generally inbuilt, but the tuning of that to become something kind of precise and rigorous and externalized um, and is a, is, a, is a discipline that you have to build on top of what you might naturally have kind of from a design mm -hmm. um, or creative practitioner approach, I think. So, yeah, uh, you wanted to add something. Oh, I was just going to say, I was just going to say that developing people's capacities to work in multiple spaces is one of the biggest challenges I hear people talk about when they're trying to work in a innovation or a um, systems change space. Is that it's it's a shift for people who have come from a background being really passionate about what they do, working really closely with people for change when your goal is suddenly so big you can't tell whether you've made a difference at the end of the day that's really challenging because you're like am i am i doing any good am i just wasting my time and so we've we have to find ways i mean part of that evaluation is helping us but we are it is working it is worth it here are the shifts it's just that they're not that don't look as tangible as when you're running a youth program when it's really clear that you've um, had a great day and you've made a great difference um so that is a challenge that that everybody that I know that works in the space is encountering is how to support people to shift into a space where we're thinking about systems and relationship and process all at the same time. Mm. Yeah. I, I'm curious if you could uh, give one or two uh, tips or suggestions for uh, really on a daily, daily practical level for people who are maybe working in the public sector in other countries or maybe within companies where they see the only way we can change this is if we change the, the infrastructure, the system, and it seems so uh, audacious, so big. How, how am I going to actually uh, make a dent in the universe here? What, what would you say to those people? Like, what can they do on a daily basis? Yeah, I think there's probably two things that maybe it's the same thing. Maybe it's not two separate things. Maybe it's a connected idea. Um, is that people like a, a classic kind of challenge is there'll be a big problem 
like housing, for example, like we've got really poor housing here. It's very expensive. So it causes lots of issues. People get sick from it. They have to live on the street from it. So, you know, it's, it's like a massive issue, but it's nobody's problem. So people will go, oh, why, how do we reduce rates of admission to hospital for children? And you're like, build better houses. But that's out of scope for so many groups, you know. Um, and so they're like, okay, it's out of scope. So I'll just scope down to this thing that is the thing that I feel like we can change. Um, and I use that example because, to be honest, it comes up all the time that housing, it comes back to housing, but nobody seems to be able to kind of hold that. But that that thing about out of scope is symptomatic to lots of the challenges that we work with. So quite often um, design, we were taught to scope. That's one of the first things you get taught is like narrow the scope so that you can have constraints and boundaries and stuff. And you use that as a negotiating tactic the whole way. You're like, oh, it's out of scope. Turns out that's not a relevant concept. I don't think in this, you have to unlearn that. You're like, I will work on this, but I have to hold the whole scope. So you have to, you do two jobs. People are it's twice as much work. Yes, it's twice as much work. Um, you're working on the thing that you've been given the chance to work on and you have to be doing everything you can to direct right. the energy, provide right. the recommendations, build the relationships. Right. And it often is relationships. So it's often someone said, um, you know, well, you have to do that. And you're like, well, I don't, I don't have a relationship with that group. You're like, well, start that relationship. Don't start the relationship when you have a project because people don't like it when you just come to them when you have a project. You're going to have to build a longer term relationship and basis for change. And if you're only ever given a project, you're just going to have to ignore that and work as if you have a platform. So to me, that idea that, oh, but I, there's no, there's no remit for this inside this project. It's like too bad. If you know that that's a central thing for change, you have to work on that outside and eventually you'll get that kind of brought in. So to, to me, we're, it's a funny shape thing. <laughs> like we're working there and we're working there. And so, we can't, can't, um, you can't buy that anymore. You can't say, oh, it's our scope, so we won't work on it. So it's not good enough. And if the scope can't be changed, just do both. And eventually, in my experience is that it actually does widen or the opportunities are there or you can start to feed in a different way of thinking and working that's more relational. I don't know if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And what was the so, other thing? Yeah, I think, well, I, I was this idea of, at not being out of scope and working on two things at the same time, I think. So maybe it is the okay. same, yep. the same idea bundled mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that we talked about last time was that idea of scaling, letting I letting go of the idea of scaling. And mm -hmm. I think and that's that's been really helpful for people when I've worked with different teams that we broaden our idea of what scaling looks like because people are often like, oh, you did this thing and it worked there, and now can we do a hundred of it across the Copy country? Base. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not about the what usually. It's not the what, it's the how and the who and the where. So thinking about scaling as being multidimensional, it might be scaling deep about narrative or principles. Um, it might be scaling down. Like, so for us, we talk about being biodegradable. If it's working and you can get it out of there, then that's, that's great. Um, but as, as scaling doesn't have to be replication. So we have to be much more sophisticated about what scaling is and unpack that more. So that, that would be another thing in my mind that's really critical to kind of um, disrupting some of the patterns that that we're working against in a way, I suppose. And, and the pattern we're working against is the a notion of scaling as a way to just duplicate more of the, um, maybe the tangible outcomes rather than the way we got there. Yeah, and this idea that it's, if we just design the right perfect intervention, somehow we'll yeah. fix yeah. issues. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. The, and the thing with service design, of course, is that there is the context, culture, uh, influences so many things that it's very unlikely that a solution that has worked in situation A will also be exactly the solution that we need in situation B, right? Yeah, well, that's what I mean about it's not about the what. You're like we've designed this thing and it does x and you're like yeah but who implemented it and how did they implement it and they did they implement it with empathy and love and um you know hospitality or did they implement it as a regimented criteria based sure. thing and then suddenly it doesn't work so yeah i think that's right context and the how because maybe the principle maybe it doesn't matter the what it just matters the how if it's delivered with care responsibly you know 
It's an interesting uh, debate, I think, also in the design community. Uh, on the one hand, we're trying to focus on actually uh, create showing uh, impact, being impactful. And on the other hand, we need to focus on the process. Well, um, uh, that's a different episode. Uh, we have had many episodes on that. Penny, how would you summarize our conversation today? Um, I mean, how would I summarize that? From my, from my perspective, it's about a shift from thinking, I guess, at the risk of sounding or, or repeating um, overused phrases, it's about developing ways of working that are responsive to the complexity of the challenges that's how I, that's what i feel it is although that could be a bit overused terms like complexity but we know people are complicated we know there's a whole lot of stuff going on environmentally that has lots of independencies we know that we can't control situations you can't you can't map everything freeze it and then like start making changes world doesn't work like that so how do we evolve our practice and our thinking and our way of working collectively so that we can be responsive learning orientated try stuff stop it when it doesn't work have ways of thinking about tracking what we're doing so to me it's about developing our practice and our thinking from policy to service design to whatever you want mm -hmm. to call it mm. um that is more um responsive and recognizes the complexity and the dynamics of the issues and mm. what it means to actually implement things on the ground versus draw a picture of implementing things on the ground um whereas where we've come at things historically is you know we think we can control it or we can prescribe it or we'll fix it with this one thing here and then we'll go over here and fix the other bit with this thing here so it's about trying to create room for more dynamic um complexity informed ways of working yeah for me, it's and then, and then I uh, uh, then we're sort of wrapping this episode up. But for me, it's the mindset shift from maybe being an architect or an engineer to uh, being on stage at an improv theater where you need to improvise all the time. You're like uh, you 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 cannot script uh, upfront what's going to happen. You're going to respond to the crowd. You're going to respond to your players and the only the most important skill you need to have there is the ability to listen to the situation and and improvise so that would be that that would be my kind of thinking here benny i can imagine a lot of people who listen to watch this episode who would like to get in touch with you and continue this conversation um what's the best way to do that yeah totally i mean people can can email me but maybe jump on twitter and say hi at penny hagen it's a h-a-g-e-n um, so I'm happy to yeah connect in whatever ways, but that's probably the most straightforward. Yeah, I'll make sure the the links are in the show notes of this episode. Penny, cool. It yeah. Thanks for the opportunity to chat. <laughs> it was my pleasure. <laughs> it was hour. my pleasure. Yeah, An early hour for you. Yeah, it was uh, awesome that we made it. Um, thanks again, Penny, for sharing and um, have a good day. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Have a good night. What is your biggest takeaway from this chat with Penny? What can you use in your day-to-day -day projects? Leave a comment down below. I'm really curious to know. If you enjoyed this episode and think it might be interesting for somebody else, grab the link and share it with them. That way you'll help to grow the Service Design Show family. And that helps me to invite more inspiring guests like Penny here on this show for you. My goal is to empower you with the most effective skills and strategies so you can build services that win the hearts of people and business. And that's exactly what you can learn in this next video. So click over there and let's continue the conversation.